Well, increasingly the question of where to next for Australia's economy is being asked as the mining sector shows signs of slowing down. Many say innovation is the key and boosting sectors like technology, medical and financial services are also critical. One person who has a flair to meet, to meet tough challenges and hasn't limited himself to one business or one particular sector is Sir Richard Branson. I caught up with Sir Richard outside the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney and started by asking him where Australia Australian business should be putting its focus for growth post the mining boom. I think Australia is a great country. Um, it's got great people. Uh, it's um, uh, it's you know managed to get through the recession. I think you know far far better than pretty well any other country in the world. Um, uh, I th and I think it's up to Australian entrepreneurs to you know, finally sort of uh, you know keep it and pull it out of the recession. Um, Obviously, you know, at Virgin, we've got, you know, we're investing in new airlines, we're, um, we're, we're investing in new mobile phone companies, we're trying to build, build the financial service industry. Um, and, you know, comp competition is, is what I think will, you know, will help, help pull Australia out. We just need lots of companies going in and trying to innovate and, and get, get, get Australia 100% back on its feet. Do you think it's taking advantage of being um, in the Asian Pacific region and the Asian century? Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's definitely taking advantage of the Asia Pacific, but I, I think you shouldn't forget that you know Africa had six percent growth last year, uh, South America had seven percent growth last year. Uh, so I wouldn't just focus on Asia, even you know, even although Asia is an enorm enormous part of part of it. And you're very lucky, I think, to be situated where you are. As a leader in business, how do you actually inspire your people, and what are the key critical things that people need in, in leadership positions need to keep in mind? Well, over you know, overall, they need to remember that a business is only its people, um, and uh, and they need to look after their people, and they need to realise that uh, most of life, most of people's lives are spent at work. So uh, they must they must create something that all, that all the people can feel really proud of, and people give them the tools to really go out and uh, and deliver. Um, and um, and if, you, if they can do that, they can have a great company that will sing. Well, space is the new frontier. What's the creature comfort you're going to take with you up to space? <laughs> I'm going to take my children to space, uh, and we're going to have the ride of a lifetime. And it's going to be you know, the, the, a whole new era in space travel, and we're, we're extremely lucky to uh, be embarking on such an adventure. Mr. Richard, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Sir Richard Branson speaking there. And to look at the state of the Australian technology sector, I caught up with Richard Earle, Managing Director and Founder of Talent International. Richard Earle, welcome to the program. Thank you, Whitney. I've spoken to several small IT startup companies recently who say that despite a very difficult operating environment, uh, there is a small, vibrant scene here. What's your view on that? Yeah, look, it, it's way too small, uh, a small scene, and it's a smaller scene than it used to be, which is unfortunate. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, there's, there's less encouragement these days to, to actually start up in that tech sector. So um, for those who are good on them, but uh, they need more encouragement. And uh, for small tech companies to become medium or larger sized, they need more encouragement, more investment, better policy. So, so why is it smaller now than it has been in the past? I think a, la a lack of a, a general blueprint for the, uh, the overall technology sector. Um, this typically comes from, from, from government, I guess, and, and, and all parties have been guilty of overlooking it, you know, and I think uh, that extends to our universities, uh, enrolment programs investment in, in the industry, attracting overseas skilled people and, and also investors from overseas and companies that might be prepared to start up over here. So, so it's a combination of those things. There's been a lot of talk about innovation and what could offset a drop in uh, the mining sector in terms of development and investment. Is the software and IT industry an area that could, uh, could boost the economy? I think so. And uh, you know, rather than wait for, for, for the mining boom to drop off, you know, we should be acting now, and, and, and one of the problems we've had is, is too many sort of um, enrolments or undergraduates for the technology courses are transferring to engineering because they think that's 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 where the careers and the dollars are, and that, that, that might actually uh, prove untrue in, in the next two to three years. So, very much so. It's it's extra important for that for that purpose. Yeah. 
So aside from boosting tertiary education uh, and those sorts of programs, what, what other strategies need to be put in place to, to really help the sector? Yeah, look, I think uh, skilled migration. I, I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of uh, visas, 457 visas, skilled migration. I, th I think some in-depth research needs to be done there to understand it rather than just a sort of a, a blanket approach, uh, which hasn't been very intelligent. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you look at places like, like the UK and New Zealand, um, they've been smarter, attracted good people, and that's created smarter homegrown companies, yes. So, so that's one factor. And also uh, investment and, and potential tax breaks. Again, the, uh, uh, there's plenty of countries around who, who, who have seen the value of this and, and, and providing tax incentives for, for companies to set up uh, uh, and even government grants. So, yeah. On the 457 visa issue, do you think it's become so politicised that uh, putting forward a reasonable argument about how this could possibly help the economy has just become lost in the political debate? Very much so, and, and especially of late. Yeah, I think it's become a big political football, which is unfortunate. Um, no one's really done any proper research. Um, I mean, even some of the figures uh, quoted by, by some of the politicians, they, they, they've since uh, admitted they were just speculative guesses. So until someone actually sits down and does some intelligent research and analysis, we'll, we'll never really know what the, what the proper approach is. Yeah. You mentioned the UK and how it put together a blueprint to really boost its, uh, its IT sector, and that has sparked some really interesting companies. What sort of lessons can Australia learn from its overseas counterparts? Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, if you look at Europe and, and America, again, uh, you know, Ireland uh, provided uh, tax breaks, um, you know, that, that created a technology sector there. Although I think their approach was a little bit simplistic and, and it hasn't sort of had a long-term benefit necessarily. Um, obviously, the US is, is well known for it. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of smart companies cropping up in Singapore. And, uh, you know, Singapore and uh, also Hong Kong with their, their, their attractive tax rates. Um, it can sometimes make sense to set up over there, and I know, I know many Australian companies that have actually set up in Singapore, when really we should have them here. So we're, we're at risk of actually becoming a dinosaur then, really? Possibly, possibly, yes. Yeah. So, um, which would be a shame, and I think, you know, um, you know we, we have some very smart people here. We have some tremendously huge markets on our doorstep, uh, and it would be a dreadful waste. So, you know, um, it shouldn't just be about selling iron ore and raw materials. We should, we should be looking at smarter things as well. So, yeah. Richard Earl, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Winnie. And Sir Richard Branson is a man of his word, honouring her lost bet to serve a stint as a flight attendant. Passengers on a flight from Perth to Malaysia were surprised to see the head of the Virgin Group as part of their cabin crew. Sir Richard said it was a bit of fun, all in the name of charity, to reciprocate the head of Air Asia. Tony Fernandez has pledged to Branson that he'll be a passenger on Virgin Galactic's inaugural commercial flight space flight. Um, no, we're having a good laugh. Um, I think I've done my. I think I've honoured my side of the bet. Um, <laughs> More than. And I'm delighted that Tony's reciprocated by going to space. So, uh, and we've raised lots of money for charity. So we've had a we've had a fun day. Sir Richard said he even shaved his legs and learned to walk in heels for his debut as a flight attendant. He's now been dubbed the trolley dolly with attitude, but says he won't give up his day job. <laughs> he certainly is a character. And now let's.